Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, dear sisters and brothers. Alhamdulillah. So today I wanted to talk about the tranquil Muslim home. And if you know me, you know I like presentations. I'm just I'm a visual learner, so I, I like to um, also bring you along to uh, to where to what I'm speaking about in in this way. So Bismillah. In order to understand what a tranquil home is, obviously we need to look no further than the Qur'an. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us first, He defines what tranquility is in many different verses, but here's a few of them. In Surah Al-Fajr, He says, أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم يا أيتها النفس المطمئنة ارجعي إلى ربك راضية مرضية Right? That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will say to the believer, O tranquil soul, and then return to your Lord well pleased and pleasing to Him. So making the connection that a person experiences tranquility by prioritizing the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then it's also a reward that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give us tranquility because we are seeking His pleasure. He also says in Surah Al-Rum, الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَتَطْمَئِنُّ قُلُوبُهُمْ بِذِكْرِ اللَّهِ أَلَا بِذِكْرِ اللَّهِ تَطْمَئِنَّ الْقُلُوبُ those who believe and whose hearts find tranquility in the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, for indeed, in the remembrance of Allah do hearts find tranquility. So these are the definitions Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us uh, for the tranquil soul. Now marriage is also connected to this concept of tranquility. Mashallah, I know many of the other speakers, maybe perhaps one or more, um, re reference this beautiful verse uh, that really teaches us about the objective of every marriage. It's to actually seek and find tranquility in one another. And how do we do that? Through affection and mercy. So there's a lot of these concepts, that, themes that you will hear over and over again that tie this objective of tranquility back to being affectionate, being merciful, being compassionate. And we'll explore that more in a moment. Um, other verses also let us know and indicate for us what we should be seeking in terms of, uh, you know, just uh, in our relationships, but also from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, comfort, right? We specifically should look to our spouses, our partners, to be a comfort to our eyes. We should also, in order to do that, practice gratitude. We should be grateful because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala promises that if we're grateful, He will increase us and that we continue to proclaim the blessings because once you lose sight of your blessings, you fall into error and uh, ingratitude, which is very dangerous for the soul, but also for the relationships that you have. So all of these are practices that will again cultivate tranquility in our marriages. Now, those are the ideals, right? And mashallah, we've again heard from many esteemed teachers already about the ideals uh, of Islamic marriage, but we have to kind of bring it to the modern crisis and the modern issue. And so I wanted to just look a mo look for a moment at the t different types of relationships that we're seeing today, and I'm sure there's many iterations and different, uh, you know, stories that we can share, but in a nutshell, I think it's very important that we define and understand what a healthy relationship looks like. And today, even according to researchers, these are pretty standard definitions that a healthy relationship or a healthy household is defined by certain qualities. Among them are that everyone in that household feels safe. So if you think about that for a moment, it brings us back to this concept of tranquility, right? You can't have a tranquil home environment if anybody is feeling unsafe, right? And this is irrespective of factors like socioeconomics, race, culture, education level, number of children, or if it's even a single parent home. If you want to see if it's a healthy household, then that's the quality you're looking for. Does everyone feel safe? And for the Muslim home, this is predicated on the, uh, the, the goal that the environment must be one in which the pleasure of God is a primary collective objective. So that means everybody in the household, in order to truly feel safe, is seeking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to please Him above everyone else, above themselves. So that is the, again, just, you know, um, in, in a nutshell, the definition of what a healthy relationship or household looks like. So in contrast, what does a dysfunctional relationship look like? And again, I want you to look at the words here and uh, think about why we have this uh, crisis in, in our community of broken homes, broken families, 
um, and skyrocketing divorce rates. Because dysfunctional households are characterized by incompatibility, lack of trust, this is really important, financial instability, abuse, violence, lack of communication, lack of empathy, controlling behavior, perfectionism, criticism, addiction, isolation, mental health issues, spiritual disconnect. This is really important. Lack of respect, undefined boundaries with family members, disloyalty and fidelity, emotional or physical. And I'm sure we can add more, but uh, if you really think about any uh, relationship that you know that um, has had any of these, you, you will likely agree that it's contributed to, uh, to the dysfunctions in that relationship and potentially even the dissolution of the marriage itself. So now I want to also address another problem that I think is very uh, much a part of why we're seeing these crises is because our expectations of marriage are so flawed. Um, you know, I, I, as many of you know, I, I give talks on marriage as well as parenting, and one of the root issues is that we come to the conversation so late. We're not prepared. Oftentimes we get in relationships without any preparation, but that doesn't mean that we don't have expectations. And what are those expectations coming from? It's usually informed by culture, by media, by whatever else we're consuming. And so we have to really address our, our um, presumptions, our expectations, and, and see where the myths lie and what's really, um, what's really real. And so the illusion of happiness, this is um, something, again, when people talk about marriage, what is the focus? The focus is always on the wedding itself, right? It, the, the excitement of marriage is usually very much tied to the celebration of marriage. So we think about, you know, the, the big, you know, hall, wedding halls, the, the clothing, um, and all these ideals that we've been maybe, especially I'm speaking to the women, um, we've been maybe looking at... <laughs> whether it's bridal magazines or um, Instagram or wherever else we're, we're watching um, people's lives or, or experiences or weddings or, or marriages, we, we kind of start to shape this expectation that that's what we want too. And then, you know, um, looking at also families and, and, and just believing that there's, it's perfect and everything has to be picture perfect. And so when you enter relationships um, with that, again, misconception, then you're going to set yourself up to fail. And so that is where, again, exploring what are the myths that we're commonly taught to have or, or to expect versus what is reality. So the first I would say is that marital bliss in dunya is attainable. And this is 100% a myth. It's not attainable because, and the reality of which you can just you know, look to the right here, is because bliss as a concept is for the akhirah. It's not for dunya. It's literally defined as perfect happiness and great joy. We are not in the abode of bliss. This is not the abode that any single person can experience bliss, especially as a as a state. You know, you might have a moment of bliss, but to expect that something is going to always be blissful is, again, uh, a myth. It's just not real. Or that a perfect marriage, quote-unquote, is a problem-free one. As we heard, mashallah, from Mufti Abdul Wahab, and there are many other countless stories, not just from the Sira, but from previous prophets, the prophets of God, who were chosen people, the elite of humanity, they suffered, right, due to their marriages and in their relationships. So there, that is just, again, a myth that, that, that you should not have problems. And it's the moment you have a problem, that it's now something that you should just discard. And that's why we're, again, finding, unfortunately, that the move to divorce comes very quickly for some people because they entered marriage thinking, well, it should be perfect and I should be completely, all my expectations should be met and this person should fulfill every desire and hope I have. And the moment that things become difficult, I'm out the door. That's just, again, wrong. Um, and then the last one would be that the more righteous you are, the more perfect your marriage will be. As we again heard from our previous speakers, the best of creation, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, dealt with marital problems. So this, there's th th that correlation just is simply false. Marriage is meant to test you. So when you adjust your expectations, recalibrate, and you start to think that these are real, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has placed us in the dunya to be tested, and he even tells us that he will test us through our relationships, now I have a more accurate understanding. And from here, we can begin to 
build. And also just a further proof of, um, you know, and I just put this list together, but I'm sure I could add on to it if I really gave it more thought, that marital problems address are addressed in the Quran. Look at the different stories of the prophets and just, you know, uh, and saintly people or other stories that are mentioned in the Quran that actually reveal very serious um, issues in households, in marriages, in families. So this is just further proof that this idea of perfect or uh, relationships just simply is not true in this lifetime. Um, actually, oops, well, I guess I was going to test you, but there goes that. <laughs> um, I was going to ask all of you if you could give me um, a number of what you thought in terms of like, you know, marital conflict, right? What, what the statistic here says, which is basically that most of marital conflicts go unresolved. And I think this is really a consolation, right? For anybody who's in a marriage and you've been struggling, and I know I work with couples all the time who feel like these are repeat problems. My God, it's been five years, six years, seven years, this isn't getting resolved, that it sometimes starts to wear you down and you just feel hopeless. But when you start to, again, look at what's happening on the ground in households all over the world, then you realize these are human issues. These are, this is just, you know, indicative of our con states, our condition as, as human beings, and also the test that many of us will experience, which is that likely not everything is going to get resolved. And how you deal with that is really going to make a difference in whether or not you're going to experience some level of, again, tranquility or peace of mind, or if you're just going to be resisting and in a state of constant anger and frustration all the time. Because Letting go and surrendering is a very big part of our faith. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us there are things you will not be able to control. Outcomes we cannot control. You could put so much effort into something, whether it's in your marriage or in your children. For those of us who have children, we know, right, that you can spend so much time investing, investing, but the outcome is with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So learning that that doesn't mean that we don't strive for solutions, but I think the reason why this statistic, again, is important is because it just reminds us that it's part and parcel of the marital experience to deal with struggles. And some of those struggles may get resolved, but some may not. What are you going to do about it? How are you going to deal with that? Running away and just discarding relationships isn't always the answer. It might sound easy, but that opens up a slew of other problems that if you're not really thinking through your decisions, um, it may come back you know, to, to hurt you even greater than the relationship you were in. And I know plenty of those stories as well. So may Allah uh, just give us again um, proper and, and accurate expectations. Now, with as with anything, right, when we look to try to look towards solutions, we don't look at symptoms, especially you know in, in a marital situation. You don't look at the symptoms, you look at the systems, right? Where are the systems flawed? What is it in that relationship um, that could be corrected? And in, 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 in our marriages, it's likely because we haven't really um, understood the rights and responsibilities. And that's what I was saying before, is that we don't prepare people properly. They just enter the marriage because they're all caught up in emotions and feelings and planning way too um, far ahead instead of really doing the necessary work to say, wait a second, do I even understand what I'm getting into? Have I even understood the what's demanded of me before I start to draw up all the things that I want? Right? Because that's where we should be starting. We should be starting from the place of responsibilities. Like, what does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala expect from me as a wife? What does Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala expect from me as a husband? And when you start from that place and you start to build your understanding, then, you know, eventually you'll, you'll learn about the rights that you're owed, but your priorities are very clear that you're more worried about what pleasing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so this beautiful hadith is, uh, you know, one that's used often to help us define the the uh, the proper structure of a Muslim home, but also just leadership in general, right? Where the Prophet says, "Ala kulukum ra'in wa kulukum mas'ulun an rayati." Each one of you is a shepherd, and is uh, and is responsible for his or her flock. And then he goes on to detail what that means. So here, very clearly, a man is the guardian of his family, and he's responsible for them. So he's putting the emphasis and the focus on the responsibility of the husband. That you have to step into the role of being the guardian of your family. And you're fully responsible for their safety, for their protection, for providing for them, all of that. That's on the man. And then for the woman, 
as well. He, the focus is on uh, what she is responsible for, which is her husband's home and his children. And so these things are very clearly laid out for us. And if we really, again, start from the place of understanding our responsibilities, then we, we begin to build a more accurate understanding. Um, and here is, you know, further, um, uh, um, you know, um, comment or, or uh, further elaboration about this, uh, this point about um, shepherding vis and, and how it's, uh, it leads to effective leadership. Uh, and that's why the analogy is so powerful, because if you think of the, the shepherd, right, they have, um, you know, they have to be ahead. They ha they, they're in a caretaking position. And so you must first learn what effective leadership is. And again, fulfill your responsibilities before demanding your rights. And so when we take apart um, prophetic uh, leadership, what do we learn? We see that the Prophet ﷺ in his own life, in every role that he had, whether it was husband, father, statesman, spirit, you know, prophet, whatever he was doing, these are the, you know, the, the qualities that he possessed. He was focused, right? And he's teaching us to be focused, to be responsible, to be knowledgeable about what we're doing, to be attentive, right, to those in our care, to be in control of oneself. So this is where we have to, you know, learn how to do that. You can't just be this person that flies off the handle and is easily triggered and gets upset with everything. You have to have comportment and learn restraint. So learning how to control yourself, being resilient. Life is going to come at us hard. There's a lot of challenges. You might have financial issues. You might have in-law troubles. You might have issues with your children. Can you stay the course and just work through those issues? And we'll talk about how we can do that. But, you know, to be, to have that resiliency, to be compassionate as well. You can't just, uh, you know, expect, uh, be, be this entitled person that expects everything to go your way without also realizing that sometimes people, you know, they, they, uh, they can't always, you know, uh, come through and, and just to have some mercy and compassion in general, being patient, respectful, vigilant, consistent and humble. All of these are prophetic qualities that were taught in terms of leadership, but obviously they apply to a marital situation for both the men and the women. We all have to try our best to try to strive for these virtues. And then how to prepare for leadership, like, okay, those are ideals and those sound really great. They're obviously prophetic qualities, but how can we do that? Well, this goes back to a term that you've heard me say many times. We heard, mashallah, Sheikh, uh, or uh, Mufti Abdul Wahab mention it, which is emotional intelligence. And emotional intelligence is really important because it's a prophetic quality. And it, what does it mean? It just means you're able to identify and manage your own emotions and the, and the emotions of other people. If we don't cultivate this quality in our men and our women, then we'll continue to see our relationships suffer. And so how do you become more emotionally intelligent? Well, first of all, you start with yourself. You have to know your own limitations, your own weaknesses, your own shortcomings, and obviously work towards that. Just again, as our teachers were saying before, you can't be the type of person that says, I am what I am, that's it. Like there's no fixing this. That's not the mindset of a Muslim. The Muslim is always in the mindset of, I'm a work in progress. I have a lot of room for improvement. And that's something that should be, uh, you know, that, that comes intrinsically from, from both the, again, the husband and the wife, that you yourself want to be a better version of yourself always. So understanding yourself well, understanding your own needs, and then you look to those in your care, and what their needs are. And you also are vigilant. Like a lot of marriages, unfortunately, in my experience, have also, um, f you know, f fallen because there wasn't a vigilance. And if you think of the shepherd, why is that analogy important? Because the shepherd has to know the threats, the imminent threats towards his or her flock. So you have to be aware of is this something, you know, is there something that I have to uh, protect my marriage from? This could be other people. It could be, um, you know, I mean, it could be many things, but you have to be at least willing to observe what are the potential threats and dangers for your particular relationship and not just kind of be, you know, going with the motions because that's when um, a lot of, a lot of people, uh, have have unfortunately you know things that they 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 just they were blindsided by because they weren't paying attention and then um you know prepare with preventative measures so this is where education is important this is where experience is important i was recently speaking to someone about you know the importance of young people especially for any single people listening or watching it's very important that before you think of marriage or before you find someone, you know, that's not the time to start 
to learn about marriage. It's really important that you start investing in that part of your life way ahead of time. And how do you do that? Yes, you can take courses and, and workshops like this or, or, or attend lectures, but I think a much better um, strategy is to seek out really healthy couples, right, that are maybe a little bit older than you and to start to try to keep them in your orbit somehow or just, you know, learn from them, watch them, observe them, look at the, how they're, you know, interacting with each other. Um, and, and that can be a really great education. So that's how we try to, you know, invest in, in preventative um, ways to protect ourselves in the long run because we're looking to good models, right, of marriage. And if your parents weren't that, that's okay. They're human beings. But mashallah, there are healthy examples in our community. Seeking counsel is also really important. You know, we have to know when to uh, turn. And I can't tell you how many people I have worked with over the years who this, they, they were their own barrier to help. Well, either one or both refused to seek help because the ego, right, the ego is our greatest enemy. And uh, within a marriage, it's very destructive to have someone who's so defiant, seeing their relationship fall apart, having maybe daily, you know, um, uh, uh, com uh, conflicts, but still not feel something compelling them to seek help. That's pure nafs, and obviously shaitan, because he loves nothing more than to destroy the Muslim home. So we have to, you know, put our faith into practice. And adinu nasiha, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi sought out advice. So who are you? If you think you're better than the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, fear God. He literally sought advice out in his relationships. So if that's a, something that is a barrier for you, then just realize you are, um, you know, destroying your own home by your own hands, and God will hold you to account. And then, of course, we have to rely on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, be humble and submit to his will. So these are how we prepare for uh, leadership. And then, of course, there's continuous ways that we can self-improve, right? The Prophet reminded us, and I love this hadith because it really speaks to something that we experience today, um, it's relevant today because we're in the age of social media where it's all about pretense. It's all about optics. So people walk around and they put, you know, as again, one of the speakers mentioned, like on social media, it's all, you know, the highlight reel of their life because it's image based. But, you know, he, this is a clear warning. The best of what a believing man can be given is good character and the worst of what a man can be given is an evil heart with a beautiful appearance. So if you're ugly inside your home, behind closed doors, you're an ugly monster. But then you're outside and you're just like everybody's favorite person, you're the social butterfly, people flock to you. That's nifaq, I mean, I don't know what else to call it. And that is, uh, you know, that's, this, that's what the Prophet is warning us about. Don't fall into that. Be a person who's more concerned with what? As we mentioned in the beginning, pleasing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that's your priority. And then this is another really important um, hadith because what it reminds us of is that there will be times where you're going to be pushed to your limits, but rise above. Rise above. Don't uh, fall into argumentation, right? Don't be a person that gives into your, what we call, or what our teachers call the default setting. The default setting of the human being is, you know, is, is low character, is because is, we're, we're nafs at the end of the day, right? Um, and that's why when you study the nufus, we have, you know, the, the, the nafs of amara bisu is the, is, the, is the bottom base nafs that most of us start with, right? We're just completely in our appetites, me, 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 it's all about me. And then we have to overcome that nafs. And when we overcome it and we start resisting, we get into what? Nafs al lawama, right? Which is the, it's the nafs that's challenging, it's struggling it's against itself. And then as we keep going in that direction, inshallah, we rise to the nafs al mutmainna. So the default is to be low, to ar be argumentative. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us so much reward when we abandon those, those qualities for his pleasure. And so developing beautiful character, being upright, honest, conciliatory, peaceful, compassionate, these are the things that will bring us ease, right, in our relationships. Beautification inward and outward, it's, it's important that we mention that because you know if you're as they say letting yourself go whether it's inwardly or outwardly it will cause resentment in the relationship and that and because life is hard and marriage can be sometimes difficult that's not an excuse to just 
forget that we are in a conditional relationship when we're married. There, it's, it's, it's based on conditions. You enter the relationship in order to have fulfillment of certain things and vice versa. So once you start slipping and letting go of those things, not taking care of yourself, whether physically or inwardly, then you are uh, taking the rights of the person you married. And so we shouldn't do that. Obviously, we should do the opposite, continuously beautifying our inward and outward states, staying focused on bettering yourself and Instead of putting the focus on your partner and over managing sometimes and that's very easy to do right we're so quick to criticize others and completely forget that we ourselves have a lot of improvement and I can tell you again from having conversations with many different couples it's usually a battling it's I mean it's a it's a fight between you know you know uh, where both sides are trying to convince me the the person between them of who of why the other person is wrong and very rarely do you see a moment where you know one or the other or both will actually be completely honest and say you know what I actually do this, this or that. It's just always finger pointing and blaming and shifting the blame and uh, blame and deflection and deflection. So we have to be more concerned with bettering ourselves and then abandoning the ego, the need to be right, as we just read from this beautiful hadith. Um, learning to pick your battles. You're not going to win every battle. It's just not going to happen. There's going to be times where you are going to be forced to swallow your pride and to do something for the sake of the marriage, for the sake of Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala that will be something that displeases you. But guess what? Allah is so generous that every time you do that for His pleasure, you are being rewarded. So is it a loss? No, but your nafs will tell you it's a loss because your pride is involved. Your ego will tell you, you know, oh, you had to do this for Him. And then, you know, shaitan, of course, is going to pour on fuel on that and make it seem like you're a victim and you were forced to do something. How about rising above that and saying, you know what? I... You know, I have uh, I have my own mind, and I want to I choose to do X, Y, and Z because it's I know it's for the sake of Allah, and that way you overcome your ego. But being a person who really just is able to see that it's not always going to go your way, but you're still not at a law at a loss when you're doing it for the sake of Allah. And then again, being humble um, and remember Allah is all knowing and will hold us all accountable if we don't behave responsibly in all of our relationships. So there's no escaping his judgment. At the end of the day, you can get things out of people in this life, and maybe you think you've won something um, if you you know if by force or whatever, but. If you are taking away anybody else's rights, um, we'll face Allah's judgment, and that should be um, something that we keep in mind all the time. So now let's shift gears to goals, because um, whether you're married or, again, uh, single and looking, the objective, again, going back to the theme of tranquility, is to create those safe and soulful spaces, spaces where truly we feel we want to be home. You know, if you're running away from your home, because there are problems there that you don't want to deal with, and that that can can you know there could be many reasons why, but you should hope or you should wish to change course. You should wish to try to transform your home back into a space that you uh, feel safe to go to and you want to go to. And so, how do we do that? Well, we need to realize that you know that marriage, a healthy marriage, again, is when both the couple see that this is a shared path that we want to walk together with. It's not one going ahead of the other. Um, it's together, in unison. We're walking on a path together. That's what marriage is supposed to be. So the team attitude is really important. We're complementary to one another, the Qur'an says, right? We're not adversaries. So the power grabs that we see nowadays as a result of, you know, third, fourth, fifth wave feminism and the incest movement and all these other movements that that ramp up men and women against each other to make us you know hate one another is not part of our faith it's literally toxic you know um, ideas ideologies and, and whatever else political movements that have unfortunately infiltrated some of our community but we have to see it that it's antithetical to our faith our faith teaches us to see one another in a complementary way 
and never to give in to this idea that you know we uh, we have to take power or else we will be powerless. All of that, uh, you know, those sentiments and those notions are just not part of our tradition. And then, how do we do that? Well, we respect indiv individual roles and responsibilities. As we looked at the hadith of shepherding, that's a very you know kind of general hadith. But when you look at the examples of the Prophet Sallallahu and his wives and all of the other great men and women of our community, their lives are examples of what it means to. Um, what what the individual roles are, right? Uh, of of between men and women, as we said, the men are the maintainers. This is in the Quran. You cannot reject that. To maintain uh, their their women, what does that mean? It's responsibility. It's amana. And sometimes the translations, and don't listen to the poor translations if they bother you. They they might frame it in a different way, but it's not about. It's more about responsibility than it is about power. So if you're reading into that and it looks like, oh, that seems so unfair, that's the wrong lens because nothing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala teaches or has taught us is ever unfair, right? Allah is the most just. So it's it's uh, about, you know, uh, putting men, and that's what, you know, um, which we'll get to in a moment, but you know, having an understanding of, of putting things in their proper place, right? So the man's proper place in an ideal Muslim home is as the one who maintains the household. And he's, you know, the, the one that we defer to for, the, for that responsibility. And for the woman, it's to, again, bring that beautiful um, warmth, that love, and, and inculcate a culture and a home where love is just flowing between everybody. We can't do that if we're absent. We can't do that if we're not at home, right? If we're away from our homes all day long, we're going to have a very difficult time managing the flow of love in our homes. And that's what we see, unfortunately. And of course, there are some women who just simply have no choice. And I'm not, this isn't about women who work versus being at home, because there are certainly working women who can do this. But it's about attentiveness. It's about really focusing on your responsibility. Honoring innate differences. You know, we're, we're living in a time where the gender binary is called into question, which is insanity. It's real. It's true. Our Lord has revealed that it's true. We believe that it's true. So what does that mean? Well, there are true gender differences that we have to know. Men and women operate differently. And part of, um, you know, the education that I think a lot of men need are on the differences of, of women and men in terms of the biological, physiological factors. Women are under immense pressure physiologically from the start of their menstrual cycle all the way until death and I don't think some women even understand the effect of the constant bombardment of hormones and the fluctuations and how it affects mood how it affects ability cognition memory there's so much impact and if you as a man don't understand that you're going to be very you're not going to have empathy and uh, to, towards your wife but if you take some time to study and say wait a second her brain is you know is is being flooded by these very powerful hormones that impact her in so many different ways maybe i need to scale back and not expect her to create you know to to cook a feast for my guests and then get mad at her and punish her so just practicing that empathy but that comes from knowledge and education and vice versa for for women as well we need to also practice empathy for our men because the pressures that our men go through I mean I would never and I don't say this to insult men but I truly would never trade spaces with a man because the immense amana that they have not only to maintain their homes and marriages but also their parents their sometimes their siblings uncles aunts extended family members the responsibilities often fall on our men and then on top of that they have for you know kifaya for the community the men are going to be asked about certain things that we don't have to worry about as women so so they're under immense pressure. When it's time for battle, nobody's looking to the women. You know, that's, I mean, depending on where you are, maybe nowadays, but battle is usually, we, we, you know, it's the men that are called. And so we have to appreciate that they are also under immense stress. So when they come home and they just want ease to be, uh, you know, not to, to receive them with that ease is really important. So these are how we are mutually considerate of each other's differences and really respecting the innate differences that we're created with and not trivializing them, dismissing them, or erasing them. This is not our tradition. We don't erase what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created and what he has also um, 
made very uh, real for us, right? And then admiring one another's individual strengths, traits, and skills is very important to reflect beauty back onto one another. So when you see the strength of your partner, that you're willing to complement them, to, to validate them, to magnify those strengths, instead of seeing them as some, you know, some, again, uh, source of, of threat to you, that's that's just your enough. So if you feel threatened by your, your spouse's, for example, if you have a spouse who makes more income than you, why would you not see that as a great honor that Allah has given you someone, I mean, what about Khadija radiallahu anha? Sayyidah Khadija, our mother, she was a, a woman of immense wealth and prestige and status. Did the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam look to her with jealousy for her success? Or was he uh, proud to be her, her husband? And obviously he's the Prophet of God, so uh, alhamdulillah, it's a two-way thing. But the point is to not be threatened by these things. And then desiring one another's success, always seeking mutual benefit. This is really important. So how do we do that? Well, here are some, and again, I know there's a lot of content here. You feel free to take a picture if you want. But just some very simple things that both husbands and wives can do. And everything presented here is mutual. It's not one-sided. I try to be very fair because at the end of the day, it's a, it takes two, right, to either make or break a relationship. So this isn't, you know, in any way a gendered conversation. It's actually all across the board. So mutual respect. Very important that we respect one another in the way that we speak, that we don't uh, demean, we don't talk down to, there isn't this whole top-down sort of relationship model that we create. No, it should be just as the Prophet Sallallahu in his own marriage, he, he marriages, he spoke to his wives as his partners, not as, uh, you know, um, as, as their boss or, or they are the, his subordinates. He never spoke to people that way. Trust, honesty, compromise. And again, you know, we may not have time to go through all of these things, but, you know, just really important. Another one is individuality. This is really important because I see this happen where people enter a marriage and they lose their identity. And we're also, you know, falsely kind of, um, you know, we're taught to look at marriage as this, this notion that I, you come as, as a half a person and you look for your other half. And no shade to bro, Brother um, uh, Ali, who, who has half our deen, uh, because that's, that's very different. But I'm talking about just this idea that your partner has to complete you. That's very dangerous. Why are you an incomplete person? And why are you seeking another person to complete you? Or have you no agency of your own to try to strive for, for a sense of wholeness in yourself and then you look to your partner to be your support in that but not the burden shouldn't follow uh, fall on them to do that for you right so don't lose your individuality have a, a strong sense of who you are and even in your marriage you know your your individual identity is very important if you only become your you know your you know the wife of so and so or the husband of so and so and now you're you know in their in their shadow that's going to breed problems, but we have to remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created us all independently, right? And, and even though these roles are very important to be a wife and a husband and a mother and a father, these are very essential roles. At the end of the day, our essential identity is what? We are ibadullah, all of us across the board. And that means that all of us have to have some individual identity that we aspire to, which is to try to, again, uh, be the, the best versions of ourselves, that which pleases Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Good communication, we know that at the end of the day, that really is what can um, make all the difference, is that we know how to talk to one another with respect, listening before we jump in and interrupt and shut down conversations, slam doors. A'udhu billah, where is this coming from? This hostility, this anger that's uncontrolled. It's because we're not, again, doing that spiritual work and holding ourselves accountable. And also, we don't, uh, we're not learning how to, how to communicate in healthy ways. Sometimes, not every conversation has to be verbal. And I say this all the time. If, you're, if you feel intimidated because your temperament gets flustered, and I know this because I've, I've seen it happen where some people, their emotions override them. So they have a lot of legitimate grievances, but they cannot get them out then don't put yourself in that position where you undermine yourself. And I'm not putting blame. I'm just saying find a better way. And the better way may be to collect your thoughts, jot them down, write them down, or find maybe someone else who can be your advocate. And that's, you know, again, where um, we're turning to people for counsel may be a better option for you than 
fighting, then trying to advocate for yourself, but it goes nowhere. It falls on deaf ears. You never get any uh, progress. So these are the ways that we can learn how to communicate more effectively. And then controlling our anger is very important. Um, if you've not done any spiritual work or haven't really studied the, the diseases of the heart, this is essential knowledge before anybody gets into a marriage. And I would say before you become a parent, please take the time to learn Tasquia, learn the diseases of the heart, there's 25 of them, and start to purify yourself because otherwise they're only going to get worse. Marriage is is primed to test us. So if you enter it with a disease, heart full of diseases, then it will only become more, more, uh, more diseased. Whereas if you try at least to cleanse, um, then inshallah Allah will give you tawfiq. So anger is a big part of that. Um, and in, in, um, you know, there are many hadith where the Prophet ﷺ talks about, you know, you know, not becoming angry, right? La taghdab, he says. Don't become angry. What he's saying, because it's sometimes mis, um, mistranslated, is not don't become angry because, uh, like, uh, literally, obviously, anger is a human emotion. But what he's really saying is don't become anger, right? Don't let the anger lord over you where all you are is anger, because you can feel angry about something. You may experience uh, situations that put you in a state of anger, but if you lose comportment and now you're just this walking, ticking time bomb, you know, bursting at the seams, unleashing anger on, on your wife, husband, children, in-laws, if in-laws are in the home, the billah. That means you're, you're not doing the work that you need to do in order to maintain yourself, let alone your relationship. Fighting fair, be a person who, you know, is sticking to the facts of the matter because there's a lot of gaslighting that happens in arguments and fights where it's like, I just want to win. It's not even about the truth. It's not even about justice. It's about, I want the last word and I want to put you in your place because I'm offended by you and I don't like you right now. And that's not fighting fair. Allah is a witness to all of that. So we have to hold ourselves accountable to have some ground rules that when we argue or when we have disputation, that we're going to remain respectful and our objective is to get to the truth, not to win for personal victory. What victory is it to win an argument with your uh, spouse when you go to bed angry with each other, the angels are upset, the household is upset? What, what is that? How is that a victory to anyone? It's not. Problem solving, right? Spouses can learn to solve problems and identify new sol solutions by breaking a problem into small parts. Sometimes you don't need to tackle everything all at once. So choose, you know, wisely. Empathy, obviously. Self-confidence. Uh, being a role model. And then the last one is also important. You know, we don't talk about this enough, especially in these types of spaces, but it is important because I've seen, again, a lot of abuse around that particular part of marriage. And it is very important that we honor the rights, especially as it pertains to the intimate rights of a relationship across the board. And so taking the time to learn what those are, what are the boundaries, what's permissible, what's not permissible, and, and not ever falling into what we see today, very common, the weaponization of it, right, or the abuse of it. This is not permissible. It is a huge right in the relationship. So if you withhold because you're angry at someone, you're upset with them, and that's your form of punishing them, the billah. You will be held accountable. The reason why we marry is for protection. There's too much fitna. So your partner is your protection from the evils and dangers out in the world. And if you now become the reason why your partner is, uh, is at risk for falling into something sinful, you will be held accountable. So that's a very important point. And I'll lastly leave you with something. I like to do play on words or acronyms, something that I hope will stick with you because I know there's information overload happens whenever we come to these events. But this is where, you know, learning that with time, with patience, with hard work, we can create metal. And that's, you know, this isn't metal as we understand, M-E-T-A-L, but metal as a quality because at the end of the day, real talk, marriage is difficult. It's beautiful. It has moments of joy, it has moments of bliss moments, it has experiences that are wonderful, but at the end of the day, it is meant to test us and to draw us near to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we have to be in the long game, right? We have to look for the long game. And the way that you do that is you see that 
there, you know, there's certain qualities and traits that if you spend time inculcating, it'll help you to achieve a quality called metal, which helps you through difficulties um, and facing uh, any demanding situations in a spirited and resilient way. That's what we want. We want our couples, our, our husbands, our wives to be resilient, to be Again, looking uh, toward um, to, to you know to, towards uh, success, and so how do you do that? Here are the ways: mercy, right? Inculcating mercy, etiquette, manners, adab. This is very important. Adab, again, the definition of it is to know to put things in their proper place. So we speak with adab. We uh, deal with one another with with respect, with mutual consideration. Uh, watch your tone. You know, if you're snarky, if you're, um, you know, uh, uh, condescending, patronizing, you are out of line, no matter what you're saying, because you're veering away from prophetic character, right? If you let your arrogance manifest in the way that you speak, this is, again, the fault is on you. You could be saying something legitimate, but the moment you adopt character that is out of prophetic character, you're in the fault, that's it. It's like you, you undermine yourself. So just be a person who's like, you know what, I'll stick my ground, I'll state my things, but I also am going to be very mindful of the way that I relay those things. And that's where etiquette comes into place. And then trust, you know, it's very important that we have trust within our relationships. So secrecy, I mean, suspicion is directly mentioned in the Quran, not to be a suspicious person, right? It's haram, this we know. But there's also something to be said about creating a, a relationship where trust is clear. You know, if you are behaving suspiciously, if your phone, you never part from it, you're, all your passwords are locked, you can never, your spouse can never even go near your phone. I'm sorry, that's highly suspect behavior. And we shouldn't do that. Um, so building trust means open communication, means having, you know, this this feeling like I, I know that this person, I can count on them. I don't, you know, sit, I don't I don't worry about them. There's honesty, there's trust. And then, of course, tranquility. That's what we all want. That's a byproduct of having good etiquette and building trust is you just feel very safe. You're going to feel safe in a relationship where those things are happening. And then on the other side of it, mercy. If I am compassionate towards my spouse, then that brings them ease. And when they are in ease, guess what? They're going to be more loving. And it's this beautiful cycle that is just, you know, all sides are, are all, um, every, all parties are, are satisfied. And so this, these are the aims, right? If we just put this into motion, this wheel of metal, then inshallah, it'll give us the tools and the skills to continue the course. Again, marriage is, is uh, a path. It's a path and it's a beautiful path. It comes with hardship like any path does, right? It's very difficult uh, to travel in any meaningful way without coming upon some challenges. But when you get to your destination and you can stop along the way to those vista points and you see really beautiful things, hey, it makes the journey all worthwhile. And that's how you want to look at marriage. Our destination is to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's a, a gift to be married. It, it really is. Um, and we should, we should want marriage and we should seek marriage and nobody should feel like, oh, because I've been married before, I'm, I'm, I, it's not marriage is not for me or I'm too old, marriage is not for me. Leave that door open to, always. And of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I've seen beautiful relationships come with people, for, for people who, are, who kind of maybe never thought it was possible for them. But we just surrender to what Allah plans for us. We don't plan, you know, uh, especially for, for the future. What do we know, right? So we surrender. But inshallah, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protect all of our marriages, inshallah. And uh, I really, again, want to thank all of you. Jazakumullah khairan.